According to news reports, last week, another period of freezing cold weather is on the way. Just when we could do with it staying mild, with the energy crisis and all. Some people say that it's climate change that's to blame because it's making rare anomalies more common. Others say, don't be dumb, global warming doesn't make stuff cold, the clue's in the name. Usually, when we look at the detail, the simplistic messages from both extremes turn out to be wrong. Not always. So, what's the truth in this case? And what can we expect for the weather going forward? Let's take a look. There's another polar vortex coming. According to some journalists, you might think, well, heck, these polar vortices are like London buses. They seem to come in threes. Really, though, it's just a reflection that some mainstream journalists don't do their research because it would be news if there wasn't a polar vortex. Here's the basics. The polar vortex is a big wind circulation that forms in the stratosphere every year. It's caused by a combination of thermal winds, demonstrated here in a helpfully graphic way by the UK Met Office, and the temperature difference between the pole and the equator. As the temperature drops over the polar regions, because the seasonal tilt of the Earth means that it's no longer getting solar radiation directly, that difference increases and pressure over the pole drops. A large circulation starts to develop like a huge cyclone covering the whole of the North Pole. The more the temperature difference between the pole and the equator, the stronger that vortex is. Being stronger means that it's stable and coherent, which is a good thing. So this image, for instance, shows one instance of the polar vortex up in the stratosphere, around about 30 kilometres up. That then has an effect all the way down, although the shape and the size varies a bit more when you get closer to the ground, with a certain amount of disturbance pushing colder air outwards. So it's not a question of, uh-oh, there's a polar vortex. It's about how strong and stable that vortex is. OK, well, that's all very nice. But how does it end up with this? The massive freeze that hit Texas that had a lot of people shivering in their homes while political people argued about whether it was the wind turbines or the gas plants that were to blame. And you can add to that the 2019 freeze that hit Chicago that was described as colder than the surface of Mars. And the 2018 so-called beast from the east that brought plunging temperatures to the UK. Let's start with the conventional well-understood explanation and then we'll come on to the brand new research that's presenting a new proposition. So, the polar vortex, generally happily spinning over the North Pole in the stratosphere at something like 200 kilometres per hour, keeping the cold air locked into place, moving in tandem with the jet stream somewhat further out, which takes a slightly more meandering route. But reasonably often, six or seven times a decade, something happens that rips it apart. Something that's described as a sudden stratospheric warming, SSWs. What happens? In the space of just a few days, the mid-atmosphere heats up significantly and this breaks down the usually westerly polar vortex and replaces it temporarily with easterly winds, disrupting its pattern, sometimes splitting it into two vortices. Low pressure above the poles can then be replaced with higher pressure, leading to warm air coming down from above and the cold air being pushed out into the lower latitudes. That's what then delivers your extreme colds to Europe and North America as well as possibly North Asia. Now the argument for a link to global warming goes like this, that because the poles are warming faster than the rest of the globe, the temperature differential is naturally going to be lower and that means the polar vortex is often going to be weaker. The weaker polar vortex is more susceptible to sudden stratospheric warming events so as the planet warms, more of those instances pushing cold air into our path are naturally going to take place. Indeed, the United Nations Climate Change Twitter account presented this in succinct form. Confused about the polar vortex, 
Usually a strong jet stream confines Arctic air to the north, stabilised by a big difference in temperature between low and high latitudes. The smaller the difference in temperature, the more the wind belts meander. Well, seems clear. Except a number of scientists called out that tweet for presenting as certain something that for which actually there is mixed evidence at best. Jeff Vallis, for instance, who said this, irresponsible of UN climate change to report this as factual. Neither the physical mechanism claimed, nor the observational evidence, nor numerical experiments support this. It may be true, but perhaps more likely not. Well, that's something of a challenge to the idea that a warming planet logically makes these more likely. But surely, if these events are indeed happening more often, then at least we could infer a connection, even if it's only correlation, not evidence of causation at this stage. True, but not so fast, because right now it's hard to say that SSWs are happening more often. For one thing, it's not been that long since they started being measured and recorded, about 50 years or so, so we don't have a very long time series to be able to judge whether recent incidences deviate from the norm. But a 2018 study looked at the impact on the polar vortex of changes simulated by a number of climate computer models and it found no evidence of statistically significant future changes from expected global warming and therefore no evidence for SSWs would consequently become more frequent. We don't know exactly why not, because there's good logic to say that they should but then you should remember that while the lower part of the atmosphere, the troposphere, is warming with climate change, the upper part, the stratosphere, is cooling, as an effect I've discussed in previous videos. So it doesn't necessarily follow that what happens between those two is going to follow the warming layer. These things are complex. They're also hard to measure, so we don't fully understand them. To support that, this paper by Osman et al. was published just a few weeks ago. It used proxy measures to reconstruct changes to the North Atlantic jet stream going back to the 8th century. And it came to the conclusion that observed jet stream variations so far are entirely consistent with natural variation, in spite of the warming of recent decades. They believe that with unabated future warming, we would begin to see the jet stream moving northward to an extent clearly distinct from natural variability by about 2060. And of course, because every change can feed into scary headlines, it turns out that that scenario also has a horror story attached, this one courtesy of the Daily Mail. North Atlantic jet stream could migrate north by 2060 due to global warming leading to dramatic changes in temperature and rainfall in Europe, study warns. A perfect example of how the state of this particular art works. Ignore the bad thing that the study says is not happening, jump on the one that could happen in decades if the world completely changes course from its current path and engages on completely unabated warming. None of the nuance of this discussion, however, is going to impact on those environmentalists who are determined to believe that any and every severe weather event from now on must be the product of climate change. And while they're not right about that, I mean self-evidently because extreme weather events have happened throughout history, the conclusion of this paper is that it's simply not proven. I mean, it's not actually shown to be false. And there are some scientists who don't agree with that paper. It's a minority view, but it doesn't mean it must be wrong, of course, that holds that these events will get more frequent. So nobody should be making any statements on this issue where they pretend to represent a consensus or an undisputed fact. And it matters because, as Texas showed, these events can particularly catch out people who are not used to the idea that extreme cold temperatures might hit them. You spend money on preparations for things you believe to be likely to happen, probably not on things described as once-in-a-hundred-year events or whatever it is. 
A paper was done to map the impact on mortality in the UK from sudden stratospheric warming events that resulted in that extreme cold weather. And it found a significant effect, with increases in deaths lagging SSWs that took place between 1991 and 2018. Such an event was typically associated with around 620 additional deaths, with a peak coming two to three days after the cold hits, and with mortality remaining elevated for at least three weeks. It's not something we should be taking lightly. But what about those news stories about what's bearing down on us right now? Because at the time of shooting this video, as I said, we're in this energy crisis. The price of gas, particularly, is off the charts. We could really do without a record freezing winter. So how worried should we be? This is reflecting the fact that the polar vortex has just returned for the cold season of 2021-2022, and it's been reported that it's showing signs of unusually early warming events over the pole, with much more warming to follow later in the month. Now, does that mean we therefore should be hunkering down for the big freeze? Maybe, but not so fast. These stratospheric events aren't easily predictable, and it's relatively unknown at the time of making this video exactly how it's going to play out. That said, it might well be good news if it does, in spite of those excitable headline writers. Simon Lee, an atmospheric scientist, explained in a recent Twitter thread that the timing of a vortex disruption could influence how it affects us. The point is that there's a period of build-up to an SSW and they tend to have a set time scale. So once one occurs, it means that the conditions won't really permit another one to come along for generally at least two months. A fact which generally means that winters with more than one SSW are extremely rare. There was one in the winter of 1998-1999 where there was an SSW that kicked off on 15th of December and then another one that kicked off on 25th of February. But even those were separated by a strong vortex in between. So if we were to have a heavily disrupted vortex October-November this year, while polar temperatures are still less cold than the peak, it would be likely to mean that a stronger vortex would then be solidly in place for midwinter when it most matters. Lee noted that V2016-2017 started with what he described as a spectacularly weak vortex, but that ended in December and the vortex became very strong. Now don't get me wrong, a weak vortex now doesn't necessarily guarantee that there might not be disruption ahead, that there'll be a strong vortex during the height of winter. It does mean those headlines are premature. Weak now doesn't necessarily mean weak forever. As is so often the case with the science, the truth is that we don't know, albeit that we don't know in a much more intelligent and well-informed way than simply, you know, not knowing. What about those new revelations that I mentioned? Well, there's a recently published paper that suggests that researchers might have missed an important element of this phenomenon which is that the vortex doesn't need to undergo a full SSW where it shreds itself for the weather of the surface to be affected. The researchers say that they've used machine learning techniques to review historical data and to identify atmospheric conditions that result in the polar vortex being stretched rather than completely disrupted. It happens because of the Arctic getting warmer than elsewhere, as we discussed, and specifically because the Arctic is losing its sea ice as well as increasing snowfall in Siberia. And those create the precursor conditions for those stretching events. And it holds that those conditions are indeed being met more frequently. So therefore, while climate change may not be creating full-blown sudden stratospheric warming events, it might well be creating those elongation events more often. And it holds that it was one of those stretching events that was actually behind the Texas freeze of this year. The lead author of the study, Dr Judah Cohen, said this. Last winter, the severe cold wave across Texas heated up the debate as to whether climate change can contribute to more severe winter weather, with those arguing for and against. However, studies supporting or refuting the physical connection between climate change and the Texas cold wave and other recent US severe winter weather events don't exist until now. 
The study also provides cautionary evidence that a warming planet will not necessarily protect us from the devastating impacts of severe winter weather. Obviously that raises questions because the previous study I quoted that said the jet stream had so far been consistent with natural variation. That finding doesn't seem to my non-expert eye compatible with the increasingly stretchy vortex proposition. The climate sceptic Patrick Michaels unsurprisingly also criticised the paper, although in my eyes he rather undermined the seriousness of his critique by starting with the old canard about I've always had trouble with the notion that warming causes cooling. Really? My propensity to take someone seriously diminishes in inverse proportion to the closeness of their arguments to this. The classic global warming can't be a thing because here's a snowball argument. But I'll pull that to one side. He went on to say he disbelieved the authors when they said that they'd applied machine learning and suggested that they'd tuned their analysis to Siberian snow cover while leaving out the impact of clouds. By the way, whether this new research turns out to be robust or not, it should be obvious by now, with all of this, that the people who tell you that you can measure trends about global warming from climate data exclusively from the United States are clearly plain wrong. Global temperature averages, including temperatures in the oceans, where most of the heat gets stored, those are needed to get a sense of how the planet is warming. Individual territories are susceptible to a number of factors that prevent them from being proxies for the whole planet. And in the case of North America and Europe, this is one of them. Particularly if a warming world does mean, and I mean open both ways, but if it does mean that because of disruptions to the vortex, winters in North America and East Asia are actually getting colder. This is the distinction between global warming and climate change. Global warming is happening to the entire planet, expressed in average temperatures, and that is creating climate change. Climate change is not warming. It's extra energy being added to weather systems. When people say, well, how can it lead to higher and lower temperatures? How can it lead to wetter and drier weather? Yes, it sounds like people just want it both ways, but this is the point. Disrupting weather systems can result in both because it moves stuff around from one location to another. One person's drought over here turns into another person's flood over there with the water that should have fallen over here. When a sudden stratospheric warming event hits the North Pole, it leads to the temperatures there being significantly warmer at exactly the same time that all of that displaced cold air is making somewhere else a lot colder. That doesn't get made easy to explain by the campaigners and journalists who genuinely do try to have it all their own way, for sure. There are people for whom every spate of bad, or even for that matter extremely good weather, is an indication of imminent doom. Like the lights that never turn green, no natural disaster is ever natural for those people, regardless of what any researchers say. It's always human-caused. Now, the fact those arguments create cynicism shouldn't distract us from the genuine complexities of what's going on. And regardless of what happens with the polar vortex, the recent unseasonably warm spell in Europe and America is about to end if it hasn't already where you are. Cold weather, storms, snow don't only come when the polar vortex has a meltdown because winter is coming. So the government's suffering from difficult energy problems right now should probably keep those fingers crossed for some time yet. The lesson of Texas 2021 stands regardless of all of this. Extreme weather is unpredictable. Hot weather, cold weather, plan ahead, don't get caught out. And don't fall for the simplified nonsense that people would have you believe about this fascinating, complex system that is the Earth's climate. Now, if you're interested in the main impacts that we can expect from climate change, you might be interested in this video I made that looks at what we learned from the latest IPCC report published earlier this year. It gives some big picture responses, so why not watch that one next?